Welcome back to American Arms Channel, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Drake. Today on the Bad Company Podcast, we are doing our first Q&A here in Episode 7. Today is, of course, about the Mighty 10 Gauge, answering some of the questions that I get most commonly, as well as some questions that you have asked. We're going to try and keep this one relatively short, really palatable. Hopefully, it'll provide you some great information. Maybe I picked one of your questions, or it's a question you've had. And of course, as always, reach out to me with more questions. Well, maybe we'll do more of this, not just on the 10 gauge, of course, but anything else we cover on the channel. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Well, I certainly hope you enjoyed that introduction. If you're just sitting here listening, well, I hope it was a little bit of a, a primer and got you excited for the conversation. It's time to dial in and focus, ladies and gentlemen, because class is in session. No, I'm not that arrogant. I just uh, I like to make fun. <laughs> but I love sharing information and I love help fixing to help fixing problems if I can. So hopefully some of the questions that I'm going to be answering here today will uh, will help you out. Maybe it's a question you asked, of course, and uh, maybe it's something you've had on your mind. As always, you can always write into the channel AmericanArmsChannel at gmail.com. You can ask questions in the comments. I'd love uh, I love helping you guys out as best I can. If I don't know, I'll let you know. I'll either let my best guess uh, have a swing at it, or I will uh, simply try and point you in the direction that makes the most sense to me and might help you find the answer if I'm not investigating it myself. So on and so forth. I could babble and babble and babble, but you're here for answering of questions regarding the mighty 10 gauge, the three and a half inch Magnum. All right, so I've made a fool of myself enough. Let's get right into it. Our first question today comes from 3040 Travis. He posted a comment on one of the, uh, the community posts that I put up, and he said he would like to know about the best steel alternative for using in older 10 gauges. He says Wisconsin passed a law requiring non-toxic shot in state and federal lands for upland and small game. Wondering what shot is best for using in short 2 and 7 8 inch 10 gauge in older side-by-sides and lever action shotguns that he doesn't want to shoot steel down the barrel, which obviously would be um, highly recommended to not utilize steel or similar hardness shot. Also, any discussion on choke sizes for different types of shot and the gold 10 is good. So kind of a two-parter there. And Travis, I thank you for your questions, your comment there. Um, I will do you one better. I'll, I'll cover both, not just picking one there. So let's cover both of your questions. Uh, the short in your first half, what is the best steel alternative for non-toxic for a 2 and 7 eighths inch hand load? I'm imagining you're utilizing a, a Winchester lever action shotgun, as there really was only one that I ever knew of that was a production gun, and it would be that classic Winchester 10 gauge. Or... Um, you're using a classic double, a Lefevre, a an Ithaca, a, um, a Fox, a, you know, the, the list goes on. So I don't know if you're using Damascus twist steel, if you're using uh, black powder proof guns. If that's the case, make sure that you're loading up with black powder substitute or black powder loads. Yes, you can make safe, low pressure smokeless, but the pressure curve is different. It puts different kinds of stresses on the gun, so highly recommend it. Just stick with black powder or safe black powder substitute. I really like 777 because of the cleanup. Uh, for 10 gauge, if you can find single F, um, that's great. Double F will work. Try to stay away from your 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 triple and your quad F if you're loading black powder um, in shotguns in a, in a Damascus twist board, just to make sure you're not spiking pressures. Uh, you know, that, that smaller granule is going to burn faster overall. Really a pistol powder. So uh, although it can be utilized as a shotgun, um, just make sure you try and stay towards those more granular, larger flake um, black powder uh, cuts and uh, black powder substitutes. So just a side note there. Uh, regarding what shop type to select, whether you are, and this would be a applicable to black powder or to modern smokeless if you have nitro proofed guns. Uh, not knowing what your situation is, I'm going to assume it's one or the other um, so I can cover both. Uh, regardless of if you're loading it with traditional wadding, so cardboard, felt, uh, um, 
fiber wadding, etc. Or you're utilizing a hybrid of modern with you know the felt and the in the cardboard and using a modern shop cup, etc. Whatever you may doing may be doing, um, bismuth is the answer. I've I've covered bismuth quite a bit on the channel. I've discussed it quite a bit. Um, Boss shot shells is really when I transitioned to bismuth for waterfowl hunting. I have used it on some small game. It is just as effective as bare lead shot at the same velocity in one pellet size smaller. So if you would really enjoy number sixes on rabbits um, or quail or pheasant for your upland game needs, go to a number five bismuth pellet. Uh, so that's the short answer. Now the long answer to that is going to be that uh, you know, bismuth shot will not only be the not the best non-tox alternative that's safe for old boars and will be lethal downrange, but it's also the most cost-effective. So for most bismuth, whether it is imported or it's domestically sourced, you're going to be looking at a 10-pound bag running you, you know, $180 to $200. So you're anywhere from, you know, and a really good deal running... $17 a pound to about $20 to $21 a pound, um, and that's before shipping uh, in tax these days here in 2022. Uh, so it really is very cost effective compared to other alternatives, nowhere near as cheap as steel. But in this situation, obviously, steel isn't even an option. So bismuth is really going to be your answer. Now, whether you're doing a black powder or a smokeless load, I would highly recommend that you work your load up to be about a one and a quarter to one and a half ounce payload. Uh, the traditional two and five eighths to two and seven eighths inch hull payload for the 10 gauge and black powder and then nitro powders really topped out between one and a quarter and one and a half ounce. Uh, most of the time, your one and a half ounce payloads are going to be the bigger shot. Uh, number four, number two, um, BB. Uh, lead pellet shot sizes for traditional shot uh, in those guns and what they were designed to handle. Um, but most of your field loads would be an ounce and a quarter. Um, buck shot would also be applicable in the ounce and a half payloads. So really stick into those parameters. You're going to an ounce and a quarter, ounce and a half of bismuth run more towards the same pellet counts as you would find in one and three eighths ounce to one and three quarter ounce of lead. Um, but obviously you have a lower shot charge weight, so you're able to still maintain the appropriate velocities. Really, between 1150 and 1300 feet per second is your standard operating uh, velocities. Uh, relatively, your pressures are going to be maintained between 8 and 9,500 PSI with those. Um, there is some RSI data out there for loading the shorter hulls. BPI has plenty of data out there for the shorter hulls. Um, if you need help, Travis, feel free to write in the channel. There's tons of options out there to make any sort of components that you have available work. And we can we can work with what you have or what is available on the market if you need guidance. But um, Ballistic Products has good data in their Advantages Manual. Um, if you don't already own it, go ahead and pick it yourself up a uh, copy of the Mighty 10 Gauge by Ballistic Products. Uh, I think... Uh, no, no, I don't think um, um, Tom Roster has any 2 and 7 eighths inch 10 gauge data or 2 and 5 eighths inch 10 gauge data. He does have magnum data, um, the 3 and a half inch magnum data, but I don't believe he'd be a good source for that. But yeah, so RSI and BPI both have the, the shorty 10 gauge loads um, spec'd out if you want to stick with the book. Um, if you are nitro proofed and you want to stay within those safe ranges, uh, Green Dot is going to be a good smokeless powder for you if you're utilizing nitro-proofed guns. Uh, so will um, things like 800X, Herco. And yeah, those are a little bit on the slower end for the lighter charges, but we're trying to be safe here, right? We don't need to beat up these old guns. We're taking them out to give them life, to hunt with them, enjoy them. We're not trying to shove down the pipe just ridiculous butt stomper loads. We can do that with our modern guns. We can beat up our modern guns, get replacement parts. These guns are never going to be made again, so let's be careful with it, right? So yeah, Travis, uh, I think that's um, going to be about right. Um, so I hope that helps you uh, with your query on loading for the short 10-gauge hulls. Again, bismuth is really going to be your best non-talk shot. And 
the upside to it is the volume doesn't change quite enough if below, you know, one and a half ounces and lower with lead that you can create practice loads if you want to uh, with lead and then use pretty much the same exact recipe, um, even if you're fold crimping and not rolled crimping down to the shot charge, you're really going to be able to pretty much identically match those loads. If you know, you're loading an ounce and a quarter of, of number six lead, uh, your bismuth equivalent is going to be an ounce and a quarter of number five let, uh, bismuth. So um, you can run them at the same velocities. All the components will be the same. They'll just be different shot, right? And the same payload weight will still go down range to the same velocities. There won't be enough of a difference. So if you need practice with one or the other, um, you can definitely do it on the cheap with the lead load and you can uh, optimize your, you know, for your hunting purposes with, of course, your non tox shot load. Um, as your, your state of Wisconsin, which I'm guessing where you live, uh, you know, kind of stinks that they've gone to a uh, total non-tox shot requirement on state and federal lands for upland and small game, but uh, that's kind of the world we're living in now. Uh, I am a proponent of the most effective shot type on game, um, balancing that with the cost for the hunter, so I'm not in agreement with regulating like that. Uh, if you wanted to start a really controversial discussion um, you'd ask my opinion on lead shot ban for waterfowl, and we could go into the weeds on that for hours on end. I'm not a total opposition for you guys who are, are total non-tox fans, um, but I digress. So, on the second question that you had, uh, you know, any discussion on choke sizes for different types of shot in the Gold 10? We actually have our next question from Josh Lau, uh, Joshua Lau, uh, Lau. Um, sorry if I mispronounced your last name uh, incorrectly, at least that's what it came up on YouTube as. So Josh, Joshua, thank you for commenting. I've had some interaction with you before via email. Always appreciate your input, always appreciate your comments. So let's get right into it. We're going to transition out of this. Travis, you might find this as uh, helping you out with your second question there. But Josh is asking about overchoking, and he stated that he would like to hear a discussion of overchoking the Magnum 10 bismuth loads. All right, so where do we start with that? That's a pretty open-ended one that we could spend hours on as well, couldn't we? At least I know I could. Uh, so overchoking, what is overchoking? Well, overchoking refers to blown or uneven patterns from firing shot through a constriction of choke too tight. Um, it causes misshape in pellets. Um, it disrupts the pattern as it exits the muzzle, as well as bouncing pellets off of each other as they continue downrange in their flight path. Um, so really overchoking is the act of disrupting the pattern through overconstriction. Uh, if you think about it, um, if you've ever taken a turkey load, and let's say you're trying to figure out which shot size works best, and you're working through it from a direction of my gun with this choke, these are my fixed factors, and now I'm going to tune the load to that. And you found that number sixes out of your 12 gauge, for example, had a, a six, um, let's say you put a six, six, zero constriction, extra full, XX full, you know, super banger, granny four barrel uh, turkey choke in your, in your gun there. And number six is pattern amazing, but number fours were horrendous. And number fives were okay. They did all right. There was good core, but they, they you know, the, the edges were kind of rough. There wasn't a really consistent cone of fire, a really consistent, um, you know, even pattern. Well, what you were witnessing was pattern blowing. You were wishing, witnessing over choking. Uh, the smaller shot size agreed more. There was more room um, to, to adjust and, and move down as it went through that higher constriction choke. Whereas with the larger pellet, what happened was it squeezed, they bounced into each other. And depending upon how malleable the material or immalleable, it will depend upon how that shot reacts as it exits the parallel section of that choke. And I keep having to digress a little bit, but it, it is pertinent and important to understand. Um, I know some of you listening to this podcast will probably have some idea, but we'll do a little bit of review. Um, so we're going to go into the choke now and explain how the choke works. So a choke is like a funnel. You're coming from the nominal bore diameter of that specific chambering for that gun. Sometimes it's over bore, sometimes it's 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 two spec. For a 10 gauge in this example, uh, your nominal bore is 0.775 of an inch. 
And when you hit your constricting section, it is the section from nominal bore to parallel. And your parallel section is going to be your true choking. That is going to be the short section of bore that is the actual choke constriction that you're trying to apply. So in a full choke in a 10 gauge, that's a 0 0.740 inch constriction. Uh, typically, some will call a 0.743 to a 0.745 a full choke when really that lands more in the light full. Completely different discussion for a different day. But uh, the, it's acting as a funnel into a smaller bore diameter. So think about it as I'm traveling down the bore, I'm the shop chart, I'm traveling down the bore. I need to condense so I can put more pellets in a, in a smaller area farther down range. So I'm going to be condensed by the choke. Well, I have to enter a funnel and transition from bore diameter to less than bore diameter. And that is your constricting section is the funnel. Your parallel section is the reduced bore diameter. So when you over choke, you are taking very abruptly, might add, even the longest chokes, you can really think about it, it's very abrupt, but small differences can mean a huge thing. That's why we pattern test, that's why we, we work on different chokes, there's different designs, different adjustments, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, we are going down really hard, and for the material or the shot size, it's causing rebound or it's causing uh, misshaping of the pellet. So with a soft material, a malleable material, you will see that pellet flatten. It will cause irregularities. And contrary to what certain companies would like you to believe with their BS marketing, pellets that are dimpled, misshapen, creased, or irregular do not fly consistent and true. The ballistics of a sphere, and I swear I'm going to get this all back around. So Josh, if you're listening and you, and you know this stuff, which I think you do, you can skip forward a little bit till you find me talking about the overconstriction. But for the people who aren't in the know and why this is important to understand is because it does add up. But when they say, oh, you know, an irregular pellet flies like a golf ball, that's not true. The, the, the physics of the aerodynamics of a sphere dictate that, that the, if the sphere is perfectly round, the faster you push it, the exponential increase in drag. The larger the diameter, the exponential, not multiple, but exponential increase in drag. So when that is a sphere, it's a constant. When it is a tumbling brick or a misshaped in, uh, blob, <laughs> let's say, uh, if it's not a bullet shape that changes the ballistic profile and is not stabilized, is effectively tumbling through the air. You think about it. Okay, I throw a baseball. It will go straight. Now, what if I took that baseball and smacked it with a hammer enough times one of the sides was flat? How easy is it going to be to throw that pellet straight and consistent? Well, you're going to have a little bit of trouble. Contrary to a football, if I throw a football with a spiral, it's like a bullet, isn't it? It's, it's like a rifled bullet uh, coming out of a pistol or a rifle or let's say a, sh uh, a rifled slug barrel. Uh, and a shotgun. But anyways, we've got rifling, we've got twist, we are throwing that oblong, that pointed projectile, and it is stabilized in the air. Spheres are stabilized through wind resistance. So, if a pellet's misshapen, think about a football. If I just huck a football, and I don't spin it, that thing's going to tumble ass over tea kettle, and it's going to go someplace I don't want it to really go. It might get in the general area, but it slows down a lot, right? Throw a football sideways as hard as you can with no spin. Watch that sucker just fly weird and slow down right before it gets to where you want to do. You have to lob it. You have to throw it a lot harder. So that is contextual to over choking. Now with steel shot, you're really not going to get too much deformation from over choking. But in this particular instance where Josh is asking about the over choking of bismuth loads, Bismuth is malleable. Bismuth can also be brittle. We'll get into the second part of that in a little bit, but this is a really good one, Josh. Thank you for asking this question because there's a lot to unpack here. This is really fun. I could make a whole podcast just off of this question. <laughs> but, um, you know, basically what it comes down to is when you go to too tight of a constriction, you are going to cause irregularities in your pattern. The science behind it is you're misshaping the pellets. You're causing rebound, especially the harder the pellet is, the more it's going to want to push outwards. So it's going to try and spray away or it's going to collide into other pellets in its path instead of going down range as a homogeneous mass within that shot chart, which is the idea, um, which is the ideal thing to happen, right? We want as many pellets arriving on target 
with each other as possible in a single moment. So from that perspective, um, overchoking is a problem. Now with bismuth, what, you know, what are our limitations? Well, I am going to tell you that you're pretty much going to top out around the 720, or, or bottom out, I should say, around the 720 exit constriction. So 720 choke, like a terror tube, or pick your choke. There's so many on the market, even for 10 gauge. 720 is typically what I find is going to be the tightest. Now, if you can find a 715, I imagine that's going to be approximately the same. I think maybe Rhino Chokes offers a 715 or a 710 constriction. But typically, you get below that 715, 720 constriction, and it's really not going to play nice, especially with larger pellet sizes. Now, the 720 plays really nice in the 10 gauge with number threes, relatively. Number fours and fives are exceptional. Um, if you're doing a light duck load, you know, you're throwing an ounce of three eighths or an ounce and a half at 1450 or 1400, you know, you're, you're doing a, uh, a stacked up load where you got a lot of filler and you're just throwing a lighter charge for lighter use, closer range, etc. cetera. Um, that makes more sense. Right. And you're like, okay, well, I'm trying to balance a tight pattern with the distances I'm shooting. Yeah. That can make sense there. Uh, but for the most part, most of us are going to be throwing larger pellets, hard, at farther ranges, so we don't want to blow our patterns, right? So 720 is typically where we bottom out. When you go down to 710, 705, even further, because you can choke all the way down to 680 with a 10 gauge. I've never seen below that, but who knows? Somebody could make one. Uh, you are going to absolutely blow your patterns. And with bismuth, because it is a fairly brittle metal, even with the modern... Uh, the modern 96% uh, bismuth, 4% tin mix, 94% um, uh, bismuth, and 6% tin mix. The 6% tin mix is typically what you're going to find the most of now. Um, but when you're running a 94.6, um, I call it an alloy uh, with bismuth, you're, you're going to resist fracturing really well. And most of your fracturing, if it does occur, is going to occur at setback, at firing, uh, the crushing power of the shot charge above the lower pellets is in the bottom of the, the shot charge is typically what's going to fracture pellets. And that's why I put a cushion wad in my bismuth loads. That's why I put a cushion wad in my lead loads. I don't want fractured pellets or misshapen pellets. Uh, I want as round as possible and I want to help those pellets be cushioned. You know, that's why a power piston wad with bismuth loads works so well because it's a lot like lead. The problem being that it fractures when it's too stressed when it gets too much setback force. So really what you're going to want to try and do is stick above that 720 in higher range. Uh, it's not absolutely a rule. I know you can choke down to 705. I've seen some amazing patterns um, from folks. I think Josh, actually you posted um, or didn't post to me. You sent to me a couple patterns uh, with the 2022 uh, production run of the two and one eighths ounce boss loads. I think you were shooting the number twos and you sent me some patterns using the 705 choke. I think it was a Carlson's that were pretty good, but uh, I'm not currently looking at it. So I can't, I can't say for sure, but it's not an absolute rule. There's plenty of guys out there who say 705 is the bottom out. But really, I start seeing problems in my own experience across the board, not just with bismuth, but with others, you know, in that uh, that 720 range. So I would expect everything above that is going to perform fairly well. And you're just going to have to test your gun and your chokes to make sure. But from an efficacy standpoint, from an efficiency, range potential and a versatility I would say that for decoying work, really just stay in that 750 improved modified to 760 improved cylinder range. And then if you're moving to pass shooting or distant decoying, you know, which is, uh, you know, a decoying being 25 to 50 yards usually is where the 10 gauge will come applicable. But then pass shooting, you know, putting that 40 to 60 yard game together, seeing that you're capable of it. Um, seeing that you're able to ethically take game, you're not going to wing them with edge patterns constantly and be chasing birds all over the marsh or, uh, 
where have you. Um, anyhow, but pass shooting, I would say 735 extra full constriction, the 750 improved modified. I have made some one shot drops with the improved modified choke out of my gold 10. And uh, previous uh, request for, for content here from Travis there, this is where uh, it kind of comes in. I'm not going to say, um, you know, the, about your uh, request for discussion on choke sizes and the different types of shot in the gold 10. Um, could go on for hours about that as well. But when it comes to bismuth and, and even steel um, or, or other non-tox alternatives, don't overthink it, guys, and don't overchoke it. Uh, you need to give yourself some forgiveness. I, I am completely gu guilty of both magnemitis, throwing the biggest, heaviest, nastiest charge down range out of the lightest, most uh, handy gun possible. I'm, I'm guilty of that. Um, I'm also guilty of overchoking uh, for, for tightening down. You know, like, oh, you know what the solution is? I really need a full, 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 extra full granny four barrel, super duper devastating you know, hyper-nuclear pattern here. Nope, you don't. And you're going to miss. And when you do hit, I bet you're going to catch them with a fringe pellet. Uh, one thing I noticed about the 720 Terror Tube with a lot of different loads, not all of them. 720 Terror Tube is an awesome choke, but it has its applications. Uh, but what I noticed with that constriction and with that specific choke tube in my Gold 10 specifically, that um, it'll provide a really tight, really beautiful core and you've got this ring of fringe pellets in kind of this semi-empty space with ragged holes in it here and there. And if you read how it's marketed on the SRM industry site, on the Wad Wizard site, you'll see that they're like, hey, you know, extra tight core, you know, shoot them in the head, but it still opens up enough that, you know, you can get those closer shots. And I've shot birds at 20 to 25 yards with the terror tube in, running the Boss Bismuth, the first year of production, the 2020 low, the 2 and 1 16th ounce. And it did a great job. Awesome on geese. Not going to doubt it at all. But it still throws an extra tight core and a kind of loose outside ring with a lot of loads. And that's not ideal. Um, throwing a softball downrange out to the 50-yard mark is not going to help you efficiently bag birds. And you're more likely to not center that bird in the pattern for your fault, for outside factors, whatever variable you want to insert. Whatever happened, you are going to be more lethal, more ethical, more moral, and, and, and have greater efficacy with your tools, with your equipment, by utilizing a more even, slightly more open pattern. That's why I tell most guys, no matter the gauge that they're shooting, a modified choke, or more so a modified pattern with whatever shell, whatever you're choosing to utilize for that specific hunt, a modified is going to be one of the best things you can have in your gun. The best patterns you can use. It's just tight enough to be really effective at slightly longer ranges. You know, 40, 45 yards, it's still an effective choking. However, in closer, it's not too mean, it's not so hard, and it gives you that nice 15 to 35, 40 yard window where the pattern is easy to get the bird in and the bird is gonna die as long as you get it inside of that pattern. So try not to over choke, try not to overthink your choke. Uh, I have found a lot of success with the 750 inch improved modified in the Gold 10. I found a lot of success with a modified 755 constriction uh, Briley choke in the Mag 10 Deluxe. And I really like the light modified, the, excuse me, not the light modified, but the light full 745 inch constriction in the Mag 10 Deluxe from Briley. It's their thin wall choke system. So really don't over choke. Always think about the application you're utilizing, regardless of gauge. Um, and, and bismuth will, will bottom out around 720. So usually, like I said, the 705 can also be an option, but I, I don't find it necessary. Even when pass shooting, I've made some crazy shots at 55, 60 yards using the improved modified choke. And it's been consistent enough that it tells me, hey, with the right load and everything, you know, like the Bismuth Devastator load I've got, it is, it's a pretty dang good load. 50, 55 yards is, is not out of the realm of possibility. And even a couple 60 yard pokes every once in a while that improve modified. You know, you put a, a snow goose in that pattern, it's going to die. Is it a duck getting pattern? Not really. Is it a honker getting pattern? Yeah, we'll put them down. You get enough pellets in there. 
I'd like to be full. I'd like to be light full or even extra full at that distance. But if I have to take a poke, improve modified will work. So there is that. I think that wraps up that question. So I hope, Josh, I hope I answered your question. Uh, Travis, I hope I touched on your secondary question there, your secondary prompt. Uh, so let's go to a shorter one. <laughs> Give my mind a little bit of a rest here. Let's take an easy one, right? All right, so from our next commenter here, Sajad Adam. I, Sahad Adam? Sajad Adam. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name. Uh, you know who you are. Uh, but you asked, what 10-gauge loader? So I'm going to assume you're asking, what is the best for loading equipment for 10-gauge? And I will say, if you have nothing else, and you're especially if you're running a break-action shotgun and you're just starting out, or you're on a severe budget, get a roll crimper from BPI or Guide, And that will take you a roll crimper, and you've probably got a drill press or a hand drill, a roll crimper will work for you. You can put it to some use. You can decap with a couple simple tools, a punch. Um, you can recap with a rubber mallet and <laughs> a, a dowel um, on a table. Um, it's a little hairy sometimes. You might pop a primer or two if you're not careful, but you can get real caveman with it if you have to. So Bottom line, very, very bottom line there, you can get a roll crimper and a couple small hand tools and go a long ways when it comes to hand loading. But, for a shotgun at least. But, um, I guess what I'll say is it'll work from the absolute best for your hobbyist or your serious hand loader down to, to what, you know, wouldn't recommend. Uh, the best overall is going to be the Ponzus Warren Duomatic 375, um, the 10 gauge model, of course. Um, but the three, the Duomatic 375 used to be what was the original Model 10 Magnumatic or any of the Magnumatic series. Uh, those were produced in the 70s through, you know, to today. The Duomatic is the modern uh, name for it. It's the, it's the same press by Ponsus Warren. Um, Pons, Ponsness Warren. Uh, there you go. PW. We're just going to call it PW. How about that? <laughs> But um, the, the, the PW Duomatic 375, absolute best. I actually just got an old Model 10 Magnomatic in. Uh, my friend, John, avid waterfowler, if you've not seen his 10-gauge content, go check it out. Uh, like me, he is long-winded. However, good information. And he has some steel loads out there that are definitely great. And he's been working on his own 2-ounce 10-gauge bismuth load. So hopefully he'll have something up about that at some time in the future. But uh, yeah, he turned me on to that. He was able to help me get one. One came up in an estate sale. Really appreciate the help, John, if you hear this. Uh, thanks, buddy. Really do appreciate it. I'm loving working with it um, instantly. The first, you know, just tinkering with it, messing up a couple hulls and doing this, that, and the other thing. It's a really, really good press. I, I, I saved quite a bit by finding an old one um, and John helping. Well, John found it, but, you know, getting an older one. If, so if you can find it, Grab one because you'll save yourself a bit of money. But, you know, the $575, $600 or whatever it costs to get one brand new, um, you know, they do have a waiting list right now. They are back ordered. You know, it's like I think the, the website says six to seven months or seven to eight months right now. Definitely the best press. Um, fully supports the hull. Uh, John at Avid Waterfowler. There again, he typed that into YouTube while you're listening to this. Uh, you will find he has a video overview on it as well as all of his loading videos for the 10 gauge demonstrate the use of the Ponzus Warren there, that, uh, that Duomatic 375 or the older Model 10 Magnomatic. So there's that. Now that's the best overall. Best value, even though I have not utilized one in my research, is going to be the Mech Size Master in 10 gauge. You can get them in any gauge you want, but the Size Master uses a collet resizer and it has most of all the same components as the Mech 600 Junior. Now, on a budget, the 600 Junior is a good press, but it can have quality control issues. It's cheaper. Uh, it will get the job done. You've seen my load videos. I've done plenty of load videos with the Mech 600 Junior. And my biggest complaint about it is my personal model came with a crooked tower. Uh, so the it doesn't quite seat right, so that's why I rotate the shell a lot when I have when I was using it. Now I've got the PW, so I don't have to worry about that anymore if I don't want to use that. 
Um, but uh, the ring resizer on that really beats up the hulls. You lose a lot of hull life with the Mech 600 Junior. Uh, so the Size Master with Call It Resizer or the Ponzus Warren uh, with the full length resizing die that supports the hull as well as resizes the base uh, appropriately and doesn't let, let you over compress the hull base, which with the way the, hull, the, the balloon base on the hulls are formed, um, with I was finding it would actually not feed into the magazine tube or cause a jam because the uh, rim would actually expand and flatten due to the, the way the Mech 600 Junior was set up. And yes, I probably could replace the sizing ring. Maybe it was a out of spec part or whatever, but you know, it's just, um, it's one of those things that uh, you don't want to have to tinker with. And it's just, it's just not ideal, but it is a good press for those on a budget. It does get the job done, um, but in automatics uh, and pump actions, it might cause a hiccup or two. So definitely recommend going to the size master if you can afford it and definitely if you can, uh, you know, the best value is in the size master. And if you can get the PW or, or wait for one, do that. Next question comes from Jacob Dean. And he asks, will you ever try and review any of the Aria Ballistic Engineering or Abe 10 gauge loads? So I have looked into the Abe loadings and while they do appear to make some really high quality loads, they're probably all hand loaded, much like what Warwolf Ordnance has done. Uh, they don't necessarily hold my interest. Uh, the, the small shot, the wing shooting and box shot loads, they don't really meet what I'm looking for or they're so akin to what I can create myself, especially for the price point they're charging, that it doesn't make sense for me to get any of them. Uh, the slug and paradox loads, however, are, are pretty interesting, and you know they're they're not something I see myself going out of my way to acquire and test. But you know, because I find my current one and a half ounce fury slug load, you know, it's going fourteen fifty or so, uh, you know, and I could push it faster, I could push it harder, but I don't really know that it's necessary. You know, a one and a half ounce slug going hard like that. We'll take care of a lot of stuff, but, um, I, you know, for my purposes, and there's nothing wrong with, if you think that they make good ammo or you've got any information on them or you've utilized them for the 10 bore, absolutely, you know, comment away down below, write the channel. I'd love to hear something about them, but for me, they just don't really uh, fulfill a niche for me. I don't see them being needed for me, so I'm probably not going to play with them. Uh, but maybe in the future I will. I'm not going to rule it out, but at least for their small shot stuff, I'm not really interested. They don't make a lot of sense to me, um, the way that they're loading up their, their small shot and their wing shooting shot. Um, even their, their purported turkey load, if I remember correctly, wasn't like, you know, I load a two and a half ounce, 1200 foot per second, 1150 foot per second turkey load. And it's lights out out of my mag 10 deluxe and my gold 10 with, with the proper choking. Uh, the, the mag 10 it's a it's a 50 plus yard turkey load out of the gold 10 it's a 60 yard turkey load um with number four nickel plated lead and two and a half ounces so for me i'm not really seeing the value point in in getting those other shot um types and just for, for the cost point you know I, I can load and reload my hulls for x amount it just doesn't make sense for me. That's that's the biggest driving factor between behind me not you know trying that. I'm I'm not really probably going to write them. I just don't have enough interest in it. But um, you know they see if they would donate to the channel, of course. Uh, but if you do use them, let me know. Let me know how it does. Um, I just don't have a high enough interest. But the slug side of things, that's a different story. The paradox side of things, they have one that's loaded into a I think a brass hull. It's a round ball or a conical mini ball style. So that's pretty interesting. That's pretty dang cool. So uh, we'll see, you know, maybe eventually, but not at this time. Uh, appreciate, appreciate the question, Jacob. Moving on, I've kind of got a multi-part here um, from Alex K. Um, he wrote in quite a long time ago, and I wanted to cover some of his questions because he is a younger viewer. And I found uh, that, uh, and he did give me a response. He, he thought that the response that I had given him uh, was very helpful and there's a few things I'd like to touch on might help some more people as they are listening here so the uh, the question 
uh, kind of came in as a multi-parter. But he started off by saying, Hi, I watch a great deal of your 10-gauge shotgun videos, and I find myself really enjoying them. To me, 10-gauge shotguns are extremely interesting, and your videos are unmatched with regard to the amount of information they contain on the subject. And, well, Alex, thank you. I did thank you for that, but thank you once again. I really appreciate the feedback, guys. Uh, it, it helps me figure out what I'm doing right and wrong, so... Uh, you know, what guys are really listening for, and I am an information-heavy channel. <laughs> if you hadn't figured that out by now, uh, I, I don't know. Hitting you over the head with anything won't do much, huh? Because I am heavy-handed when it comes to the information, but really appreciate it. Um, he says, I've wanted to get a 10-gauge for quite a while now, and nobody else really talks about them in such detail. So I really appreciated that you take the time to share your knowledge with people like me. Uh, hell, even finding someone that is actually enthusiastic about shooting them is difficult. I've told several of my friends and family that I wanted to 10 gauge, and every one of them says something along the lines of, that gun is going to knock the piss out of you, why would you want something like that? It seems that everybody is quick to hate on the 10 gauge because of its recoil, but I believe it is, has more practicality than people say it does. I see that it still has great potential and versatility, so I'd like to get one as my first shotgun now that I'm old enough to buy one. And uh, for anybody wondering, Alex did find one. We'll get into that in a little bit. But what I wanted to get into here is, is uh, it was a good prompt. And then I did respond is, is to talk to him about the misconception of 10 gauge recoil. Now, many people think that the 10 gauge just delivers this fierce recoil in all loads all the time. Uh, they expect that a, a good day in the goose pit with a 10 gauge will leave them just battered and bruised. Uh, it's really a lot of intimidation by the cartridge and they see the, you know, the increased stature of the gun and they're like, Oh geez, that's gotta be just a butt whooper. Well, you know, there are fierce 10 gauge loads out there. You know, you can, you can make them or you can purchase them and they will certainly let you know, you know, that you just pulled the trigger on it. Um, it's physics guys, equal and opposite reactions. Uh, but you know, the vast majority of the loads are nowhere near uh, the recoil impulse that, that's delivered to the shoulder of a shooter out of something like a light seven to eight or eight and a half pound 12 gauge using super heavy magnum loads, you know, or even just standard heavy magnum loads. You know, you think about it like a Super Black Eagle 3 or a Winchester SX4 coming right in at just above seven pounds in the 28 inch barreled versions. That's a lot of transfer of energy when you start shooting your three inch ounce and a quarter to ounce and a half magnums, your three and a half inch, you know, steel and lead magnums. You know, you start putting 10 gauge charges in that light little gun. It's gonna, you know, you're gonna feel it. You're gonna feel it. It's, it's physics, guys. So, uh, you know, most people are intimidated by the 10 gauge, um, but it's also from poor recoil management. It's not so much that the guns are really beating you up. But the people that, that use them, or maybe you've used them, you know, it, it takes some skill and some experience to be able to handle the larger frame guns. Um, and one thing I had said to him is, is you know, the guys that, that shoot them and then, or say, all oh, those will beat you up, are the same individuals that shove really heavy, really fast three inch and three and a half inch super magnum cartridges into light 12 gauges and think they're, you know, they're accomplishing something. Um, it's kind of a paradox of ignorance. I, um, I'm not saying that to degrade those individuals. It's simply the truth that they, they really don't know what they're talking about or they have yet to be educated on that concept of how physics works or, or how the 10 gauge doesn't actually beat you up as much as you think it does. Um, and, and, and it really does boil down to that. It's a matter of physics. You know, a heavier gun with a heavier load will recoil less um, or equal to a light gun with a heavy load. Uh, the, the 10 gauge is obviously not the most pleasant um, if you are stuffing three ounces a shot at 1,200 foot per second down it and you're using a gold 10 light with a 24 inch barrel. Yes, Jarek, <laughs> in Ohio, I'm talking to you. You're a crazy man and... That's stinking awesome. We'll talk about that some other time. But yeah, you can do it. You can throw three ounces of TSS or lead downrange at a, at a butt naked speed. But why? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that to yourself? 
that's going to hurt, right? That's not going to feel good. That's a lot of energy going to your shoulder. That's it's like over 70 foot five foot pounds of energy being felt in your shoulder. Um, it's a lot. I mean, can we, uh, you know, anybody say, uh, you know, cartilage damage or a dislocated shoulder? Um, that can happen, right? It's just like an elephant gun. Elephant guns kick. Uh, but your normal loads for a 10 aren't going to be in that sort of recoil range. So, you know, a, a 10 gauge autoloader is going to obviously be the most pleasant. Uh, but, you know, brake action, bolt action, pump action are all going to be relatively the same. But really what's going to be a big driver, a big driver is the action design, how it functions, you know, and especially in some automatic, the gold 10 even in the steel variants, isn't as pleasant as the MAG-10 or SP-10, just because of the action design, uh, how that gun operates, or how those two different guns operate. Uh, you know, when you're just over 9 pounds, um, it's a very manageable firearm, but the recoil is pretty heavy. Uh, when it's, you know, 11, 11 and a quarter pounds, the gun's pretty heavy. Um, it slows your roll down just a little bit, but you don't get beat up as bad especially when compared to like super magnum 12s so it's a give and take right so the 12 gauge you know in my opinion can have much fiercer nastier recoil than a 10 gauge i have really put together some 10 gauge loads that you know like turkey load development it's a butt stomper it's a lot going down range pretty hard um you just end up getting beat up over time. But for waterfowl loads specifically, you know, you stay at that two ounce and less range, it's not going to hurt you, you know. And a good day with it, you know, a high volume day, really not going to beat you up. I, I tell you what, too, the ounce and three eighths, ounce and a half, and ounce and five eighths steel loads I use during snow goose season in the Gold 10, you know, with the magazine tube extension on it, gun weighs close to about 10 pounds. Completely pleasant, shoot it all day long, hammer away at geese, doesn't hurt my shoulder. Um, really, really not a problem. But fit is a big thing too. You know, if a gun doesn't fit you, I don't care what gauge it is, well, maybe 16 gauge and up, or, or 20 gauge and up, let's say. So 20, 16, 12, and 10. If the gun doesn't fit you, it's probably going to beat you up. So, <coughs> excuse me, getting a dry throat here because I'm trying to dump so much information in. <laughs> but you know length of pull the fit of the gun will really drive a lot of your recoil management too so a lot of 10 gauges are bigger guns if you're a smaller statured guy or gal it's not that you're not tough enough to handle the 10 it's that the gun probably doesn't fit you it's too long i mean you think about this you know can you shoot a gun that's too short for you yes how about shooting a gun that's too big for you I mean, you can do it, but how good are you going to be? The analogy I always use is think about running a mile or even a quarter mile. You're going to go around a, a high school track, right? Somebody tells you, you got to run a quarter mile. You can go as hard and fast as possible. It doesn't matter what time you get, but you got to run the whole thing. You got to run all you got the whole way. Would you rather do that in a pair of shorts that are too loose for you? They're too big or a pair of shorts that are just a little too small? So the big shorts are going to be falling off you, even with the drawstring, it's going to loosen up, it's going to be a pain in the butt, you're going to trip over it, you're probably going to bust your lip, right? And the small shorts, yeah, you might chafe, yeah, it might be uncomfortable, but you're not going to trip over them, bust your lip, right? Kind of a weak analogy, not super weak sauce, but it's a little weak, but it, it, it's that kind of idea, right? The gun needs to fit you like a good pair of running shorts. So... That's, uh, that's where I will digress with that. Now, um, moving on to another part of Alex's comments and questions. He said, one of the biggest problems that, uh, is that I simply cannot find, uh, you know, a BPS 10, which is what he had selected or any other 10 gauge gun for that matter. He said, I've looked in several gun stores, went to the gun show near me. Uh, and there were dozens of 16s, which is another eclectic, uh, you know, gauge for a lot of guys. Um, 16 is a great gauge, by the way. I love all the gauges. <laughs> they all have their purpose, right? Um, but he said there wasn't a single 10 gauge of any type. And it made him wonder if he was looking in the wrong places or he's just unlucky in his search. Um, but he can't find what he was looking for at the time, and it was very discouraging. Uh, and then he went on to detail why he wanted a BPS 10, which were all very, very 
valid. Um, and, and my response to that is, if you're struggling to find 10 gauge, patience is the word. Unfortunately, we don't live in a time anymore where we can get our stuff on demand, and the firearms market especially has seen a very high demand in products. 10 gauges have seen a rise in popularity. Um, you know, have they crested their 1% uh, you know, uh, of the market share? Probably not. Um, Percentage-wise, they're probably much lower, but there's been a significant interest in them. I'd like to think that maybe my channel has uh, helped spur some of that spur some of that interest. But you know, every time somebody like Kentucky Ballistics or Iraq Veteran eighty eight eighty eight posts on YouTube a ten gauge video, there's renewed interest in the Mighty Tens. So from there, for the um, the discerning ten gauge owner collector, patience is the word. Uh, we just don't you know live in an environment that we can be. Uh, demanding of the market and if you demand too much and you're, you're just gonna I gotta have it you're gonna pay way too much for these shotguns guys if you want brand new the BPS 10 and the gold 10 are manufactured every year they take a couple years off here and there but the demands enough that they they keep doing it year after year it's been in production since 1993 going on 30 years next year um, they'll show up around June they kind of do every year they show up around June so keep your eyes out for that you'll nab those guys for the BPS 10, you know, anywhere from 750 to 1100, and the uh, the Gold 10 anywhere from 1450 to 2000. Just uh, depends upon where you are and, and who you're trying to get it from, so on and so forth. And they typically hang around on the market for several months before they're out of stock. So brand new, there's that. Um, every spring, there's kind of a dump of 10 gauges after waterfowl seasons close and before or just as turkey seasons are starting. Uh, your SP-10s, your MAG-10s, your double barrels, your single shots, uh, your old gold 10s, your old BPSs, all of those are going to end up on the market. The days of gra grabbing a, you know, a MAG-10, grabbing a BPS-10 for less than 400 bucks are gone, 100%. You will never see them again. Uh, and that's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Uh, but if you've got $600 to $1,200 in your pocket... You can find a good quality 10 gauge or a well-used one that you can tune up or fix up or Cerakote or, you know, refinish, whatever you want to do for, for a decent price. Um, there, there may be some sub $600 deals still out there to be had, um, you know, closet, barn find kind of stuff, just a guy who's looking to get rid of it, etc. But um, you're in that, you know, 10 gauges in general have entered that $600 to $1,200 range even on the used market. So... Just be mindful, and also, if you're one of those guys buying $1,000 BPSs, just stop. It's not worth that. Stop Stop paying that. You ruin it for the rest of us, okay? <laughs> um, or paying $2,000 for a freaking SP-10 or MAG-10, guys. Good Lord. It's way too much. I know, you know, free market and everything like that, but good God, don't be such a dummy with your, uh, your money, you know? Um, just be patient. Patience is, is, is a virtue and a wallet saver for sure. But um, yeah, springtime is mid to late spring is usually the good time to pick up 10 gauges in my experience and just find what you want and be patient. It's the best thing I can recommend. You will eventually find it and get a hold of it. Uh, the problem with the 10 gauges is the guys who shoot them and are really passionate about them, uh, they tend to keep them. So it's usually the guys who can't hunt with them anymore or bought it on a whim or bought it because they had to have the biggest, baddest, nastiest thing and then they can't shoot it or they realize, oh, this is too expensive to shoot or whatever the case may be. So there is that. And finally, uh, he had a great question about developing 10 gauge loads and, and comments. So um, he said that another thing he wanted to ask was how to develop loads for 10 gauge without blowing your barrel up. He goes, I really like the sound of creating one hand loads for shotguns, but I don't know how they can be tested safely. He said, at first, I thought that you would work up the loads in the same manner as working up loads for rifle cartridges, where you'd be watching for pressure signs while slowly increasing the powder charge. After looking at some forums, however, I am beginning to think that this could be dangerous, as the people on the forum said that shotgun shells don't show any reliable pressure signs. Um, yes and no. Again, that's another topic that uh, could spend hours on and definitely would like to bring in some subject matter experts, not just your hoity-toity Jim Hillbilly, which I guess I would fall into that category, or category, category, <laughs> what am I saying? 
category. Um, but yeah, um, you know, he went on to say, to me, it seems that the only way of testing custom loaders is to shoot the gun remotely with a string um, to see if the load is safe. Uh, he feels like that would end up a lot of root barrels. I know that aim manufacturers have special equipment that can measure chamber pressure, but he's assuming that I do not have it. Um, so he's interested to know how I do it. Basically, how do I load off the beaten path? Well, and I gave him a whole diatribe um, going into that. And maybe I'll post these Q and A's up on the the uh, All Things That Go Bang blog. Might be helpful for you guys who like to read, but. Long and short of it is the 10 gauge is in a weird place where the modern 10 gauge guns, you know, the, the pretty much the G10 and the, the BPS 10 are very much capable of handling the pressures that the Super Magnum 12 generates. The weak link is more so with the components the hulls aren't necessarily up to the task so they can provide pressure signs a lot sooner um i have had overpressured loads i have popped primers before it's something that happens when you're working off the beaten path i don't recommend it and it's not something that i will take lightly with a grain of salt uh, if you've ever watched z cups channel you'll know that um, he blew up uh, his camo BPS 10 at one point because he was mixing two powder types and doing experimental two ounce steel loads. And I'm not really sure what his end goal was, but it, it was a bad idea. And he eventually, you know, he, he posted, he was like, yeah, it was a bad idea. I blew it up and don't do that. I, you know, he even said when he was talking about it, don't do it. It's an experimental load, but that kind of stuff, if you get a little complacent with it, you can hurt yourself or, or at very least damage your equipment that's expensive to replace. So yeah, don't take hand loading, especially with experimenting and working up loads off the beaten path, um, out of the, not out of the book, you know, um, with any sort of, of lightheartedness. It needs to be very well thought through, very well evaluated, and uh, you know worked through. If we were able to uh, magically adjust the SAMI specifications for a 10 gauge up to, maybe we don't even do it at a map of 14,500. Maybe we do a map of 13,500. You know, um, right now, just going up 1,000 PSI for the 10 gauge could produce enough of a window to allow a whole new regiment of cartridges and, and not even so much velocity, but really just for non-tox loads to be loaded with higher payloads. Um, the 10 gauge works as it is. So there's not a huge drive for it, but I do see and understand it and would love to someday maybe introduce a 10 gauge super magnet with like a three and five eighths chamber or a three and three quarter inch chamber. Um, you know, and the hulls wouldn't really actually be that but effectively they would become a plus p 10 gauge uh with with better built hulls i mean honestly if you build a turned brass or even blown brass 10 gauge hull and a three and a half inch super magnum or three and a quarter inches or, or you know whatever you do for for length you can push those pressures up pretty dang high and that brass will will assist in that you know the 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 gold 10 barrels, the mag, the, the, not the mag 10, but the gold 10 barrels and the BPS 10 barrels are definitely capable of it. The bolt lockups are definitely capable of handling that. It's just a matter of making sure the guns are able to handle a super steady diet of it and making sure that um, the cartridge cases themselves are able to handle that and not produce false pressure signs or uh, fail at those higher pressures. Um, and that's a lot of more where your danger comes from with, with shotgun loads that go over pressure. It's not so much that you're going to pop or bulge a barrel. You've got to get well above. With, with most barrels, especially a 10-gauge and heavy 12-gauge barrels you're, that are modern, you're going to be getting into the 20 to 30 plus thousand PSI range before you get a bulge in front of the chamber at the forcing cone. Um, and you're, pro you're going to get to around the 45 to 50,000 PSI before you just pop the barrel and just detonate it like a pipe bomb so is it easy to do that well you're stupid yeah um but 
you are probably not if you're just working out of the book and you're going a little bit over or you're, you're saying, okay, well, this payload here with this powder does this and this powder and this powder are what's listed, but this powder is in between and I think that this one will do this right for my niche loading or this is what I have and I want to not do this charge. I want to go slightly over and I did so on and so forth and you work up easily and very gently from there. You're probably going to be okay. You're probably going to be safe and you definitely are never going to reach that pop status. But the risk you run is pierced primers and ruptured cases are not good for you and they're not good for the gun. So considering the hulls that you're using, considering the equipment that you're using is very important. Yes, the 10 gauge is capable in the modern guns of running Super Mag 12 pressures. The weak link, once again, repeating myself, but the weak link is the hulls. So with that understanding, we know the weak link's the hulls, unless you're turning your own brass hulls, you're not, and those are gonna be heavy, let me tell you what. But unless you're doing that, you're not going to have the ability to push the limits, right? So you gotta stay within those parameters still, relatively. You know, you will start to see when you get into that 14,000 PSI range, you know, 13 to 14, you're really going to start seeing that full stop, go no further signs that you're going to have really misshapen. You might start rupturing something um, and you don't want to do that. Um, you're not going to pop a barrel, but you are, you are risking damaging your shotgun and potentially, you know, damaging yourself if you get a really bad gas leak. A ruptured case and it comes back at you. Thankfully, you know, BPS 10, the gold 10, the receiver design kind of prevent a lot of that, but you could still, you could still, there's potential there for an injury, you know, send an ejector flying, damage a bolt, seize a bolt up, etc. Well, to seize a bolt up, it'd have to be really, really high pressure. But point being, a lot of guys think that a shotgun shell is going to suffer a catastrophic failure. Like, Hey, the Sammy spec is 14.5, and at 15.5, the gun goes kaboom. Well, guys, that's not that's not the situation. That's not reality. It's gonna take a lot more than that to pop most modern guns, um, if not all modern guns. Uh, so, you know, basically, the long and short of how to work up loads off the beaten path is going to be to not just jump into it. Uh, don't go into it thinking, well, I have three months experience hand loading. I've been working out of the book and I, you know, I can read a powder burn chart. I'm going to give it a try. I got plenty of components. I'm not scared. Sometimes a little healthy dose, a little sprinkle of fear take you a long ways, guys. Be respectful of your equipment. Be respectful of the power that you're trying to control down a thin metal tube. Uh, so there's, there's that, you know, Again, you're not going to pop that barrel until you get that 40, 50,000 PSI, but you're going to start doing damage at 20,000. You know, your, your proof cartridges for a 10 gauge are only in the 14, 15,000 range, maybe. Um, the 10 gauge is stuck. The 10 gauge magnum is stuck in the mid to early 30s. So we would have to super mag it. We'd have to apply better case design. And frankly, as good as our shot shell loads are, we have been stagnant on shot shell hull and case technology for the past 45, 50 years. They're really not that different. We have better polymers now, but our manufacturing processes haven't changed. You know, if we developed a 3D printed hull that was rimless, that could feed from a magazine or from a tube, so on and so forth, all the fun little things that we can do with modern technology, if we added heavier bases, if we did multi-part case technology that was focused on higher pressures, better performance, etc., and applied it to all the gauges, you would see a revolution. But it's got to be profitable. And that kind of stuff's expensive to make. So the gauges for a long time will probably be stuck where they are. We'll see rifle and pistol cartridges go a lot farther before we see the shotgun uh, develop. But can it happen in the next 10 years? I think so. Unfortunately, the 10 gauge probably will lag behind and might be antiquated um, with that technology because, you know, it takes a lot of money to move mountains. So 
that's kind of a digression there. But yeah, um, pretty much my recommendation in short is that if you're working off the beaten path, you know, go off experience, bounce off of guys who know what they're doing. Um, you know, don't be an idiot. Uh, work off of experience and diligent research. Um, people, guys that destroy a modern shotgun barrel through load testing are pretty much doing something extremely stupid. They're utilizing powders that are too fast for the payload or too fast in general for shotguns. Um, they have poor to horrendous loading techniques, possibly. Um, unknown barrel obstructions from previous loads, you know, like a squib, and they didn't catch it. And then they're going to blame it on a load and be scarred for life, that whole thing. Hopefully not physically, but, you know. Um, and bottom line, modern shotguns, if you're using a modern shotgun for load development, it's a quality gun. It's been proof tested, etc. You know, you're, you're really not going to ever, being safe and conscious and working through things, you're not going to cede the pressures that are going to start putting you in the uh-oh, oh-no territory. Um you know, that's why like a Super Magnum 12 or a heavy 10 gauge barrel is a really good test gun, even if it's an auto, because it just has a lot of meat there. It's got a lot of, of, of um, strength to work through those loads. I, I test my 12 gauge hand loads, whether I intend to run them in an old gun or not. Um, when I'm working something up or adjusting something off of book, I even if I'm not, I test them in like my Super Black Eagle 3 or my Vinci. Um, just because I know those guns are proof to handle stuff. So if I get a little bit of an uh-oh moment, like, oh, that was a little too spicy. One, I'm not destroying a gun that I can't replace or can't get parts for. And two, I'm utilizing a firearm that is going to be safe to run stuff that's a little bit hotter than normal. Um, potentially, not something that I'm intending to do that with, of course, but, um, or it could be. Um, you have the freedom to, to make your own choices. You have free will. So, with that, guys, I'm going to wrap it up. I don't think we really went that short on this podcast, but as always, if you have any questions whatsoever, go ahead and leave a comment. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Write me at AmericanArmsChannel at gmail.com. I'm here to help, guys. Love giving my input. Um, love sharing my experience and my knowledge just so it helps you enjoy your time afield. Um, to make every moment count. As always, guys, I'm Drake for American Arms Channel. God bless. Keep your powder dry. We'll see you next time.